In the late 1920s, the notorious Castellamarese War erupted within the Mafia, pitting two influential bosses against each other, Joe the Boss Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. By 1931, a rising mob figure, Lucky Luciano, sought to quell the escalating violence and scrutiny drawn upon the Mafia by eliminating both powerful leaders and restructuring the organization's operations. Luciano devised a meticulous plan to remove the bosses, recognizing the urgent need to curb excessive bloodshed and growing public attention. His initial move involved the elimination of Joe the Boss, Masseria, a task entrusted to one of his most reliable hitmen, Albert Anastasia. The pivotal moment arrived on April 15, 1931, at a seafood restaurant, Nuova Villa Tamaro in Coney Island, a frequent haunt of Masseria. During a card game with Luciano and his bodyguards, Masseria excused himself for a restroom visit, an agreed-upon signal. This signaled the entry of the hitmen, including Anastasia, Bugsy Siegel, Vito Genovese, and Joe Adonis, positioned strategically outside the establishment. The ambush unfolded swiftly, with more than 20 gunshots from 32 and 38 caliber pistols echoing through the air. Four bullets struck Masseria's back, while another found its mark in his head, ending his reign of power. In the subsequent months, another hit team targeted Maranzano, effectively terminating the war between the factions. With the elimination of the warring bosses, Lucky Luciano and his associates seized the opportunity to reconstruct the Mafia's structure. They established a governing body known as the Commission, aiming to streamline operations and maintain order. However, to execute the Commission's directives, an enforcement wing was yet to be organized, an essential element that remained absent from the revamped Mafia structure. In the wake of the power vacuum left by the fall of established Mafia bosses, a menacing force emerged on the streets of New York, Murder Incorporated. At its helm stood Albert Anastasia, a figure whose name struck fear and terror throughout the criminal underworld. Anastasia, a notorious hitman, wielded significant control over New York's waterfront and the influential dock worker unions. The press, recognizing his formidable reputation, bestowed upon him the chilling moniker, the Lord High Executioner. However, the roots of Anastasia's ascent into the criminal hierarchy traced back to the quaint fishing village of Tropea on Calabria's east coast in southern Italy. Born as Umberto Anastasio on September 29, 1902, his upbringing unfolded in an environment that would later shape his ruthless trajectory in the world of organized crime. Umberto Anastasio, characterized by a tempestuous temperament and an inclination towards violence, forged his path through the mob ranks. He transformed into Albert Anastasia, a figure who would etch his name in history as one of the most feared leaders of Murder Incorporated. Raised in a family of twelve siblings, eight brothers and three sisters, Albert faced early adversity when his father, Raffaella, a railroad worker, passed away when Albert was merely ten years old. To support his family, a young Albert abandoned his education, embarking on a perilous journey as a deckhand on tramp steamers at the local shipping yard. His innate mental fortitude and physical strength became indispensable assets in this hazardous line of work. At the age of 15, displaying audacity and determination beyond his years, Albert clandestinely boarded a ship bound for New York as a stowaway, accompanied by his brother, Anthony Anastasio, later known as Tough Tony. Anthony, like Albert, delved into the realm of organized crime, becoming the sole other family member to make significant inroads within this perilous world. The transformative journey of Albert Anastasia, from a deckhand navigating the treacherous waters to becoming the feared head of Murder Incorporated, underscored his unyielding determination, resilience, and penchant for leveraging violence to ascend the treacherous ranks of organized crime in New York City. Arriving in New York in 1917 with scant resources, threadbare clothing, and minimal formal education, Albert Anastasia faced an arduous start. Despite these dire circumstances, his unwavering determination and physical strength paved the way for him to secure employment as a longshoreman on the bustling Brooklyn docks. It was in this gritty and bustling milieu that Anastasia would not only grow in stature, but also wield significant influence and authority. 
Remarkably, this same environment would later see his involvement in aiding the war effort during 1942. The docks of Brooklyn, under Mafia control, offered both challenges and opportunities to those working there. Employees were expected to offer a portion of their earnings as kickbacks to the mob. However, a notable perk was the tacit allowance by the Mafia for workers to pilfer cargo without facing severe consequences. While occasional confrontations over stolen cargo occurred among the workers, nothing compared to the fateful turn of events in 1920. A dispute between Albert Anastasia, then an 18-year-old, and another worker named Joe Torino escalated from a verbal altercation to a physical brawl over cargo. The altercation turned fatal as Anastasia, displaying a ruthless demeanor, drew a knife, resulting in Torino's tragic demise. Witnesses recalled the chilling expression on Anastasia's face, describing his eyes as cold and devoid of emotion, a characteristic that would resurface in his demeanor years later. Subsequently convicted of murder, Anastasia faced a grim fate and was sentenced to await execution in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison. However, fate took a turn when after 18 months his conviction was overturned. A pivotal figure in Sing Sing named Jimmy the Shiv de Stefano, serving time during the early 1920s and having ties to the emerging Lucky Luciano, recognized Anastasia's potential. De Stefano, serving as both the prison barber and an aide to the future mob leader Luciano, highlighted Anastasia as an ideal addition to Luciano's cadre of young mobsters, a valuable asset for the budding mob chairman. This recommendation would mark a turning point in Anastasia's life, propelling him from the brink of execution to becoming an essential figure within the rising echelons of organized crime in New York City. Lucky Luciano's intervention proved pivotal in saving Albert Anastasia's life. Prior to a new trial, Luciano's hired hitmen eliminated the witnesses, resulting in Anastasia's release from prison on a technicality. This experience imparted a crucial lesson. Within the realm of the Mafia, eliminating witnesses became a crucial strategy, a principle Anastasia would come to understand and adopt. Stepping out of Sing Sing as a free man, Anastasia encountered a transformed world. The Prohibition era had taken hold by 1920, offering lucrative opportunities for the mob, which they exploited for years to come. At just 20 years old, Albert Anastasio made a significant decision to change his name to Anastasia, solidifying his connection to the underworld. Immersed in the world of organized crime, Anastasia found himself in the company of influential figures such as Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and Lepke Buchalter. Returning to the waterfront, Anastasia assumed control over local gambling operations and managed the mob's loan sharking activities. Throughout the 1920s, Anastasia's stature and influence within the Longshoremen's Union grew exponentially. Associated with approximately 30 assassinations between 1920 and 1923, Anastasia managed to evade indictment or conviction for any of these crimes. However, in April 1923, a targeted attack on Anastasia and Biagio Giordana resulted in Giordana's death and Anastasia's serious injury. Later that year, Anastasia faced legal repercussions when arrested on a gun possession charge, leading to a return to incarceration until 1925. Towards the late 1920s, tensions erupted in the underworld, igniting the Castellamarie's war between powerful bosses, Joe the Boss Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. Both originating from Castellamare del Golfo in Sicily, these influential figures belonged to the old guard Mustache Pete era of the Mafia, adhering to traditional mob practices rooted in old world values and strategies. The escalating conflict set the stage for a significant shift in the power dynamics within the Mafia hierarchy. The aftermath of the Castellamarese War ushered in one of the most violent periods in mob history. Over the course of two years, New York's streets became the battleground where Joe, the boss Masseria, and Salvatore Maranzano fiercely vied for supremacy and control within the criminal underworld. However, it was Lucky Luciano who ultimately orchestrated the cessation of this brutal conflict in 1931, heralding a restructuring of Mafia operations. The strategic elimination of Joe the Boss Masseria was a pivotal step orchestrated by Luciano with the indispensable assistance of mob hitman Albert Anastasia. 
Masseria's demise unfolded during a seemingly ordinary lunch meeting with Lucky Luciano at his favored seafood restaurant on Coney Island. Luciano tactfully excused himself, coinciding with the hit team's calculated assault on Masseria. The abrupt onslaught saw over 20 gunshots, fatally striking Masseria multiple times, ending his reign of power. Following Masseria's elimination, Maranzano, his rival, met a similar fate later that year. However, Anastasia chose to remain uninvolved in this particular hit. Maranzano fell victim to an attack within his Manhattan office, paving the way for Lucky Luciano's ascendancy and control over New York's underworld. Subsequently, Luciano took a proactive step to prevent future gang conflicts by establishing the Commission, a consortium comprising five influential mob bosses. This collective aimed for equal power distribution among its members, instituting a voting-based mechanism to settle disputes and avoid further gang wars. The Mafia Commission's creation marked a departure from the old hierarchical monarchy-style structure that Luciano and his associates despised. Instead, it embraced a more democratic approach, comprising top-tier figures from both the Italian and Jewish gangster circles. The formation of the commission symbolized a paradigm shift within the Mafia, reflecting a departure from the traditional autocratic leadership style toward a more collaborative and structured governance system, thereby laying the groundwork for a new era in organized crime. In 1929, Lucky Luciano, alongside his trusted confidants, established the Mafia Commission, a governing body comprising New York's top mob bosses. The commission aimed to mediate conflicts among families and authorize targeted assassinations. However, for carrying out these sanctioned hits, an enforcement wing was imperative. This gave rise to a fearsome new faction in the New York underworld, Murder Incorporated, operating discreetly from a candy store in Brooklyn. At the helm of Murder Inc. stood Lepke Bacolta, known for his role as a labor racketeer and contracted killer alongside Albert Anastasia, an imposing figure controlling the New York waterfront and dock worker unions. Murder Inc. struck terror within the mob, orchestrating an estimated 1,000 hits during its active years. Anastasia, relishing his central role in executing the commission's orders, derived a chilling pleasure from being a pivotal figure in these meticulously planned executions. Under Anastasia's leadership, Murder Inc. assembled a cadre of ruthless, disciplined and efficient hitmen. Mendy Weiss, an integral member born in July 1906, proved to be one of Lepke Bukolta's most reliable associates, actively involved in several key operations. He met his demise in March 1944 at Sing Sing Prison's electric chair. Harry, Happy Mayon, born in October 1908, gained his nickname ironically due to his perpetually sullen expression. In 1931, Mayon, alongside Abandando, played a role in aiding Abe Rellis and Martin Goldstein in eliminating the three Shapiro brothers. His life ended tragically in February 1942 at Sing Sing's electric chair at the age of 33. Martin Bugsy Goldstein, born in October 1905, emerged as a prominent figure within Murder, Inc. His involvement in a shootout with the Shapiro brothers resulted in the loss of the tip of his nose. Goldstein contributed significantly to the workings of Murder, Inc. until his tenure was cut short. These individuals formed a core part of Murder, Inc., a highly organized and effective group of hitmen operating under Anastasia's leadership, executing the commission's orders with precision and ruthlessness. Their exploits and the organized violence they orchestrated cemented Murder, Inc.'s reputation as a formidable and feared entity within the criminal underworld of New York City. Charles the Bug Workman, born in October 1908 in New York, gained notoriety for his involvement in the 1935 Dutch Schultz murder. Unlike many of his counterparts, Workman managed to evade the fate of the electric chair, instead receiving a life imprisonment sentence. Astonishingly, he was released in 1964 and lived until 1979, passing away at the age of 70 due to natural causes. Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss, born in 1909 in New York, stood out as one of the most prolific and versatile killers within the gang. His methods ranged from shooting to stabbing victims with ice picks, drowning, live burials, and strangulation. Strauss met his demise in 1941 at the age of 31 in the electric chair. 
Frank the Dasher Abandando, born in 1910 in New York, had a grim penchant for fatally stabbing his victims through the heart with an ice pick, a method he favored. Reports described his demeanor as displaying no fear, exhibiting a macabre humor around his impending fate. Abandando met his end in February 1942 at the age of 31 in the electric chair. Abe Kid Twist Relis, born in 1906 in New York, gained notoriety for becoming an informant. Responsible for executing several key members of Murder, Inc., including one of the bosses, Lepka Bukalter, Relis played a crucial role in the downfall of the notorious organization. Tragically, before he could provide evidence that might implicate Albert Anastasia, Relis met an untimely demise in November 1941 at the age of 35, reportedly falling out of a window. Lepke Bukalter, born in February 1897 in New York, was a central figure in Murder, Inc. His leadership and involvement in organized crime contributed significantly to the gang's operations until his ultimate downfall due to the efforts of informants and law enforcement. These individuals, with their distinct methods and roles within Murder, Inc., shaped the dark and violent legacy of the notorious criminal organization. Their lives and actions, marked by violence and criminality, remained intertwined with the rise and fall of Murder, Inc. within the criminal landscape of New York City during the early to mid-20th century. Lepke Bacalter, known as the oldest member of the gang and a prominent labor racketeer in New York City during his time, was also a close confidant of Albert Anastasia. Notably, Lepke remains the sole American mob boss to have received the death penalty, meeting his end in March 1944 at the age of 47 in the electric chair. During Anastasia's tenure with Murder, Inc., he implemented a crucial lesson he learned from his time in prison, the importance of eliminating witnesses. This philosophy became evident in multiple instances, in 1932, although indicted for murder involving an ice pick, the case was dropped due to a lack of witnesses. Similarly, in 1933, Joe Santoro, a defiant laundryman refusing to pay kickbacks to the mob, was gunned down by Anastasia in front of witnesses, who subsequently suffered amnesia or disappeared. In 1939, Pete Panto, a longshoreman aiming to purge the Union of Racketeering, met a grim fate at the hands of Anastasia, strangled and buried in a lime pit, silencing his resistance. However, the year 1935 presented a significant challenge for Murder, Inc. following the assassination of Dutch Schultz, the Bronx beer baron. Anastasia played a pivotal role in the plot targeting Thomas Dewey, who posed a threat to the Mafia's operations. He meticulously observed Dewey's routines, even masquerading as a father with a borrowed baby carriage to survey Dewey's Fifth Avenue apartment closely. However, when the Commission learned of Anastasia's plan to eliminate Dewey, they intervened, cautioning him against such an action due to the potential heat it could bring upon the mob's leadership. These events underscored Anastasia's strategic prowess and his integral role within Murder, Inc., revealing the intricate and often perilous interplay between organized crime, power struggles, and the efforts to maintain a delicate balance within the underworld. Amidst the tension between Dutch Schultz and Thomas Dewey, Schultz's desperate attempt to eliminate Dewey, who was closing in on a conviction for tax evasion, was met with a resounding denial from the Commission. Aware of the potential repercussions and the excessive attention it would draw, the Commission refused Schultz's request. However, Schultz, known for his fiery temperament, sought an alternative route and approached Albert Anastasia for aid. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Anastasia promptly informed Lucky Luciano and the Commission, prompting an urgent meeting. The consensus among the leaders was clear. A contract was put out on Dutch Schultz. Schultz found himself shot in the bathroom of the Palace Chop House restaurant, sustaining a critical wound below the heart. Despite staggering out and sitting at a table, the hit carried out by members of Murder, Inc., Charles Workman and Mendy Weiss led to Schultz's demise. However, the aftermath took an unexpected turn. Instead of alleviating law enforcement interest, the incident backfired. Dewey redirected his focus to another key figure, Lucky Luciano. 
Luciano's subsequent conviction on charges related to forced prostitution in 1936, resulting in a 30 to 50 year sentence, sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld. The apprehension of the mob's chairman signified the vulnerability of even the most influential figures within organized crime. Amidst this upheaval, Anastasia seized a period of relative calm in 1937 to enter into matrimony with Elsa Barnese, a 19-year-old who had relocated from Canada to New York. Together, they built a family of two sons and two daughters. Despite Anastasia's deep involvement in the New York underworld, Elsa steadfastly maintained the facade of her husband being an industrious, law-abiding citizen, vehemently denying any connections to criminal activities. This juxtaposition between Anastasia's public persona and his clandestine life within organized crime underscored the complexity and duality of his existence. Anastasia, despite his deeply rooted ties to the underworld, presented a starkly different persona to the public eye. He claimed ownership of a dress factory and portrayed himself as a mattress salesman. In tandem with his fabricated professional image, his wife Elsa painted a picture of Anastasia as a devout churchgoer who abstained from alcohol and was always home by 9 p.m. Their marriage endured until Anastasia's assassination in 1957. Following his death, rumors surfaced alleging that Elsa reverted to her maiden name, Barnese, and relocated to Canada in the late 1950s. The sanctity of marriage didn't deter Anastasia from being involved with organized crime. He was frequently summoned back into the criminal fold. Lepke Bukalter, a prominent figure in Murder, Inc., sought Anastasia's assistance when faced with looming racketeering and narcotics charges. Anastasia obliged, orchestrating the disappearance of over a dozen witnesses crucial to Bukalter's case. Despite a nationwide and international manhunt, Bukalter remained concealed, reportedly cited in Poland and the UK. Astonishingly, Anastasia had kept Bukalter hidden in plain sight, right within Brooklyn's boundaries. In 1939, a critical moment emerged when a Murder, Inc. associate, Jack the Dandy Parisi, was tasked with eliminating Morris Diamond, a Teamster official and key witness against Bukalter. As Diamond walked along his usual route at 6.15 p.m., Parisi, concealing his gun behind a newspaper, approached from the opposite side of the street. Lowering the newspaper, Parisi swiftly eliminated Diamond, crucially removing a vital obstacle in Bukalter's legal battles. This event underscored the ruthless efficiency of Anastasia's network and the meticulous execution of criminal agendas orchestrated by Murder, Inc. Anastasia, observing the escalating heat from law enforcement authorities on the mob, found himself at a crossroads. The commission pressured him to reveal the whereabouts of Bukalter, forcing him to make a tough choice between his loyalty to his friend and his allegiance to the mob. Opting for the latter, Anastasia arranged a clandestine meeting with Bukalter, who, after three years in hiding, looked drastically altered, sporting a mustache and a noticeable weight gain. Anastasia assured Bukalter that a deal had been brokered with the FBI, allowing him to serve only a few years in prison. Eventually, on August 24, 1939, Bukalter turned himself in, facilitated by radio broadcaster Walter Winchell, who publicly negotiated the surrender deal via a broadcast. Under Winchell's direction, Bukalter was instructed to be at a specific location at a designated time, purportedly to surrender peacefully. Unbeknownst to Winchell, federal agents discreetly monitored the rendezvous. When Winchell arrived with Bacalter at the agreed-upon spot, they were picked up by J. Edgar Hoover's car, seemingly heading toward a resolution. However, this marked the termination for Bacalter. He was subsequently charged with the 1936 murder of Joseph Rosen, a Brooklyn candy store owner who resisted leaving town as instructed by Bacalter. The decision to eliminate Rosen was inadvertently heard by Abe Relis, a mob informant. Bukalter's legal proceedings ended with his conviction and, notably, his execution in 1944, becoming the first mob boss to face capital punishment. The downfall of Murder, Inc. materialized in 1940, when one of Anastasia's top hitmen became a government informant, disclosing comprehensive details about Murder, Inc.'s operations, including unsolved murders, as part of a plea to evade the electric chair. This betrayal signaled the unraveling of the once formidable criminal organization orchestrated by Anastasia and his associates.
The chilling saga of Murder, Inc.'s downfall saw its key members, including Lepke Bacalter, meet their fate in the electric chair due to the testimonies provided by informant Abe Ellis. However, Albert Anastasia, the infamous Murder, Inc. boss, seemed to possess a shield of protection thanks to his significant connections and influence within the mob. This aura of power would prove pivotal for him in the turbulent year of 1941. Anastasia, often referred to as the Prime Minister of the Underworld, was renowned for his strategic approach, seeking diplomatic resolutions to problems whenever plausible within the realm of organized crime. However, navigating the treacherous underworld often demanded alliances with formidable figures, and Anastasia was no stranger to forging associations with powerful individuals like Frank Costello. This strategic alliance provided muscle to Anastasia while reciprocally offering political support and cover to Costello and his associates. By November 1941, Abe Reles, the ex-Murder Inc. hitman turned government informant, found himself ensconced in the Half Moon Hotel on Coney Island under the strict surveillance of the FBI. Tasked with testifying against Anastasia, Reles was under constant guard to ensure his safety. However, Reles's mysterious death on November 12, 1941, at the hotel's restaurant roof, sparked controversy. Officially labeled a suicide attempt by jumping from his fifth-floor window, speculation swirled that he might have been pushed and the scene staged to appear as suicide. The circumstances surrounding Reles's demise were shrouded in suspicion. Despite the FBI's rigorous surveillance and the presence of guards, his fatal fall raised eyebrows. In a peculiar turn of events, all five policemen entrusted with Reles's safety claimed to have inexplicably fallen asleep, professing complete ignorance of the incident. The untimely demise of Reles, the key witness against Anastasia, fueled conspiracy theories and doubts about the authenticity of the official narrative, leaving an indelible mark on the already murky landscape of organized crime and law enforcement's role in curbing it. Amidst the murky circumstances surrounding Abe Relis's mysterious demise, the lack of concrete evidence led to the dropping of charges against Albert Anastasia. However, suspicions lingered given the understanding that any attempt to eliminate Relis would likely have required Anastasia's authorization. The collapse of the case against him was a matter of immense scrutiny, prompting District Attorney William O'Dwyer to remark on the perfect case against Anastasia, disintegrating without a trace. In 1942, Anastasia enlisted in the army, assuming the role of a tech sergeant. This strategic move was geared towards bolstering his application for naturalized citizenship, which was granted in 1943. His military tenure was short-lived, ending in 1944 due to age-related discharge. By 1945, Anastasia had relocated to a fortress-like mansion nestled on the Palisades Cliffs at 75 Bluff Road in Fort Lee, New Jersey. This opulent estate sprawled across 1.3 acres, boasting 34 rooms, 5 bathrooms, and a perimeter fortified with barbed wire, complemented by vigilant Dobermans. A stark contrast to his earlier residence in Red Hook's Little Italy on Pioneer Street during the 1920s and 1930s following his release from Sing Sing, this new abode provided sweeping views of Manhattan and marked a significant shift in his lifestyle. However, this palatial haven eventually emerged as a focal point of a looming tax evasion scandal in the 1950s, drawing attention from law enforcement. Anastasia's purported income as a dress contractor for the Madison Dress Company, alongside other listed occupations, including a stint in the cheese business from 1936 to 1940, raised eyebrows. The discrepancy between his reported earnings and the acquisition of a $100,000 property piqued the interest of the FBI, intensifying their scrutiny. As the pressure mounted, Anastasia harked back to his earliest lesson in the underworld, eradicate potential witnesses. The looming specter of the law and the FBI's relentless inquiries spurred Anastasia to resort to the methods that had often served him in the past, shrouding his actions in secrecy and generating an aura of impenetrability. In April 1954, Vincent Macri, Albert Anastasia's bodyguard, met a grim fate. His demise was perceived as an attempt to silence him due to his intimate knowledge of Anastasia's financial dealings, potentially making him a pivotal witness in the impending tax evasion trial. 
A year later, in May 1955, Charles Ferry, a plumber and his wife, were brutally murdered. Ferry was on the brink of divulging details regarding the services he had rendered to Anastasia at the Fort Lee mansion, services that reportedly amounted to approximately $9,000. The Ferry couple's residence was discovered drenched in blood, yet Charles Ferry's whereabouts remained unknown, with only blood-soaked shoes as tangible evidence. The suspicious series of events, including the death or disappearance of key witnesses, prompted a reduction in Anastasia's charges, resulting in a lenient one-year prison sentence. Following the disbandment of Murder, Inc., Anastasia found himself reverting to the role of an underboss to Vincent Mangano. However, his history as a formidable gang leader rendered him reluctant to settle for a subordinate position under a boss he neither respected nor shared common ground with. The simmering discontentment within the Mafia was about to reach a boiling point, setting the stage for a seismic power shift within the criminal underworld, and once again, Anastasia stood at the heart of the impending upheaval. Vincent Mangano, who had presided over what would eventually become the Gambino crime family since the restructuring orchestrated by Lucky Luciano in 1931, found himself at odds with Anastasia. Over the course of two decades, tensions mounted between the two mobsters, exacerbated by Mangano's growing resentment toward Anastasia's close affiliations with Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello. The strained relationship finally reached its breaking point, fusing personal enmity with the long-standing rift. In April 1951, the disappearance of mob boss Vincent Mangano and his brother Philip Mangano sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld, signifying a pivotal moment of transition and turmoil within the organized crime syndicate. The disappearance of the Mangano brothers marked the prelude to a turbulent chapter in the annals of Mafia history, instigated by internal power struggles and lingering animosities. In the wake of Vincent Mangano's disappearance and the discovery of Philip's body in a Brooklyn swamp, Albert Anastasia was confronted with a dire predicament. His presumptive act of seizing control by declaring himself boss of the family following Vincent's disappearance was a direct breach of an implicit mafia protocol, a rule deemed worthy of capital punishment, the assassination of a mob boss. However, Anastasia didn't tread lightly. When summoned by the commission, he offered a staunch defense, asserting that he had acted in self-defense, contending that the Mangano brothers intended to kill him. Supported by Frank Costello and other influential figures within the ruling panel, Anastasia's narrative was validated and he was officially sanctioned as the new head of the crime family. Nevertheless, the new mantle of leadership didn't shelter Anastasia from further entanglements, a few months into his ascendancy, he found himself once again in the Commission's crosshairs, this time alongside Willie Moretti, then underboss to Frank Costello, head of the Luciano family. Acting as emissaries, Anastasia and Moretti were tasked with managing a substantial payment to silence a convicted bookmaker. Moretti, entrusted with handling the $200,000 payment, faced a critical discrepancy. The commission questioned the disparity between the sum already dispersed and the expected total. Anastasia swiftly distanced himself from the dubious transaction, asserting his innocence to evade retribution, but Moretti wasn't as fortunate. On October 4, 1951, during a lunchtime gathering at Joe's Elbow Room restaurant in New Jersey, Moretti met a tragic demise. Gunfire erupted at 11.28 a.m., leading to Moretti's lifeless body sprawled on the restaurant floor, bearing fatal wounds to his face and head. The episode underscored the volatile dynamics within the Mafia, highlighting Anastasia's ability to navigate treacherous waters, simultaneously cementing his grip on power while navigating the perilous pitfalls of mob politics, where allegiances could be fickle and survival depended on a careful dance of strategy and alliances. Albert Anastasia's role as a crime boss placed him back under the spotlight, yet not for the righteous reasons. In the intricate web of mafia dealings, Anastasia found himself entangled in a situation that breached another cardinal rule. The killing of a citizen. By 1952, Anastasia resided in a fortified mansion in New Jersey, resurrecting his position as a mob boss, reminiscent of his Murder, Inc. days. However, with power came a volatile demeanor, an uncontrollable streak that threatened to seal his own fate. 
The backdrop to this was the capture of Willie Sutton, a notorious bank robber connected to the Mafia by the police in February 1952. Sutton's capture gained widespread attention, with headlines splashed across newspapers and news of the event hitting national TV. Arnold Schuster, a 24-year-old clothing salesman and amateur detective, played a pivotal role in the capture. Schuster, interviewed on television near his residence discussing Sutton's arrest, inadvertently angered the underworld. Reports suggest that the Lord High Executioner, allegedly Anastasia himself, felt outrage at Schuster's role in ratting out Willie Sutton. According to government informant Joe Valachi, during the 1963 McClellan hearings, Anastasia allegedly ordered the silence of Schuster less than a month after his televised appearance. On March 9, 1952, Schuster met a brutal demise, a grisly mob punishment for squealing. He was ruthlessly shot twice in the groin and once in each eye, a stark reminder of the merciless repercussions within the Mafia for those perceived as informants. Anastasia's involvement in Schuster's murder further painted a sinister portrait of his leadership, showcasing a dangerous propensity for unchecked violence. It not only underlined his reign's volatility, but also sowed seeds of dissent within the criminal underworld, setting the stage for escalating tensions and potential retribution in the turbulent world of organized crime. In May 1955, the Lord High Executioner, Albert Anastasia, faced the consequences of his financial misdeeds, found guilty of tax evasion for underreporting his income from the late 1940s. Despite employing tactics to eliminate witnesses and evade the mounting legal case against him, Anastasia was ultimately sentenced to a year behind bars. However, during the initial two months of his imprisonment, the government pursued additional measures, aiming to strip Anastasia of his citizenship to facilitate his deportation to Italy. By late 1955, this deportation ruling was overturned, allowing Anastasia to remain in the United States. Upon Anastasia's release from his tax evasion sentence in 1956, he emerged amidst a shifting power dynamic. The landscape had changed significantly. Figures like Lucky Luciano and Lepke were no more, and Murder, Inc. had dissolved. Only Anastasia and Frank Costello remained prominent, but Costello's position was soon threatened by a formidable and ambitious mobster, Vito Genovese. May 1957 marked a critical juncture when Vito Genovese, alongside Anastasia's underboss Carlo Gambino, plotted a power move against Frank Costello. Genovese, patiently biding his time for ten years, orchestrated an attempt on Costello's life. Vincent Chin Gigante received orders from Genovese to assassinate Costello. As Costello walked toward the elevator in his Manhattan apartment lobby, Gigante approached him, shouting, This is for you, Frank! Reacting swiftly, Costello turned, narrowly escaping a fatal bullet that grazed his head, causing minor injury. Believing his mission accomplished, Gigante fled the scene. The startlingly close call prompted Costello to reassess his position as the family's boss. Feeling vulnerable and aware that lucky Luciano remained imprisoned and powerless to intervene, Costello made the decision to step down, relinquishing control of the family to Genovese. This pivotal event marked the passing of leadership from Costello to Genovese, reshaping the power dynamics within the Mafia. Anastasia, having survived his own legal battles, found himself positioned within a landscape undergoing seismic shifts where allegiances shifted and ambitious mobsters vied for dominance and control. The events leading up to Albert Anastasia's demise portrayed a convoluted web of shifting loyalties, intricate power plays and conflicting accounts regarding his role in the mob's internal conflicts. After relinquishing control of the family to Vito Genovese, Anastasia found himself increasingly isolated, having lost the support of his former allies. Conflicting narratives emerged regarding the attempted assassination of Frank Costello in 1957, a pivotal moment often clouded by varying reports and historical perspectives. Early accounts suggested Anastasia's involvement in orchestrating Costello's hit, while subsequent narratives asserted that it was actually Genovese who orchestrated the attack. Some theories even proposed that Genovese eliminated Anastasia to weaken Costello before targeting the latter. Genovese's maneuvering within the mob's ranks turned mobsters against Anastasia, creating fissures in his position at the top. As Genovese garnered more followers, 
Anastasia's authority became increasingly precarious. Amidst this turmoil, Anastasia's attempts to encroach on Meyer Lansky's territory, particularly in Havana's casino operations, further aggravated tensions within the criminal underworld. Lansky, a longtime ally, felt affronted by Anastasia's territorial ambitions. With Genovese and Carlo Gambino consolidating power, Anastasia's fate was sealed. The stage was set for the former Murder Inc. boss to be ousted, and Gambino poised to ascend as the new leader of the Anastasia family. On the eve of his death on October 26, 1957, Anastasia met with Santo Traficante, a formidable mob boss entrenched in Florida operations. The purpose of their rendezvous was to discuss joint ventures, particularly investments in a new hotel in Cuba, a realm where Traficante already held substantial interests. The intricate entanglement of mob politics, rivalries, and shifting alliances painted a tumultuous backdrop to Anastasia's ultimate downfall, revealing a world where loyalties were transient, ambitions cutthroat, and treachery a constant peril. The circumstances surrounding Albert Anastasia's demise on that fateful day in 1957 were steeped in intrigue and historical echoes of past mob-related incidents. His meeting with Santo Traficante, a prominent mob boss, was shrouded in speculation and potential ulterior motives. Some conjectured that Traficante aimed to persuade Anastasia to invest in a casino venture at the Hilton Hotel in Havana. However, other rumors insinuated Traficante's involvement in a plot against Anastasia, driven by resentment over territorial disputes and the latter's incursions into Cuban interests. On October 27, 1957, the morning was chilly in Manhattan when Anastasia arrived at the Park Sheraton Hotel alongside his bodyguard, Anthony Coppola. The historic Park Sheraton, known for its opulent pre-Depression-era origins, had previously been the backdrop of a notorious mob shooting in 1928 that claimed the life of mob kingpin Arnold Rothstein over unpaid gambling debts. Entering Arthur Grasso's barber shop within the hotel for his routine grooming session, Anastasia settled in for a customary haircut, shave, and hot towel treatment. Meanwhile, Coppola parked the car in the underground garage, leaving Anastasia alone with the barber. As the barber attended to him, two masked gunmen abruptly entered the shop, directing the barber aside. Seizing the moment of vulnerability while Anastasia was in the midst of the relaxing hot towel shave, the assailants, concealed behind scarves, unleashed a hail of bullets toward the mob boss. Startled and in a state of shock, Anastasia instinctively lunged forward, believing the attackers were in front of him. However, the reflection in the mirror portrayed a disorienting scene, and in the frenzy, Anastasia inadvertently lunged toward his own reflection, not the gunman. Tragically, amidst the chaos and confusion, bullets tore through Anastasia's back, hip, and hand. In the aftermath of the chaotic scuffle, a final fatal shot ended the life of the once-dominant mob figure, marking the violent end of the Lord High Executioner. The echoes of mob history reverberated once more through the Park Sheraton, an establishment with a grim legacy intertwined with organized crime and tragic events. The aftermath of Albert Anastasia's assassination was marked by an eerie silence that lingered in the air of Arthur Grasso's barbershop. The scene painted a grim picture. Anastasia lay motionless on his back, a stark contrast against the white towels, surrounded by a pool of his own blood, life extinguished. A mere day after his tragic demise, Anastasia's funeral took place at Greenwood Cemetery in South Brooklyn. However, the turnout was notably sparse, with only a small gathering of twelve individuals attending the ceremony, including his eldest son, Albert Jr. The absence of key figures and prominent mobsters signaled a somber reality. Anastasia had been cast out and abandoned by the once loyal circles of the criminal underworld. Even among the ranks of organized crime, his passing was not commemorated with the fanfare typically accorded to significant mob figures. The void left by Anastasia's demise swiftly became a battleground. Reports emerged in February 1958 of a clash between the Irish mob and other factions vying for control of the Brooklyn waterfront, escalating into a power struggle over territory. Allegedly, orders from Carlo Gambino to Joe Profaci prompted two hitmen to eliminate Anastasia. 
Speculation swirled around the Gallo crew, led by the notorious crazy Joe Gallo being assigned the contract for the hit. Following the barbershop incident, the alleged hitmen sought refuge in Cleveland, and rumors suggested that their fate might have been discussed at the notorious Appalachian meeting months later. However, the identities of these hitmen remain shrouded in mystery, their roles in Anastasia's demise never conclusively revealed. In the wake of Anastasia's death, Vito Genovese convened a pivotal gathering of top-tier mob leaders at Appalachian. This assembly wasn't just a show of authority, but served as the platform for Genovese to announce his ascendancy as the leader of his own crime family and deliberate on crucial mafia operations, setting the stage for a new era in the organized crime landscape. The infamous Appalachian meeting in 1957 signaled a turning point in the history of organized crime. Over 100 high-profile mobsters congregated, attracting the attention of local law enforcement, triggering a swift FBI intervention resulting in 58 arrests. Contrary to the intended effect of bolstering Vito Genovese's position as the new boss of bosses, the raid served as the catalyst for his downfall. The unwanted publicity and increased scrutiny on the Mafia stemming from the police raid drew blame upon Genovese from within the mob itself. Amid mounting dissatisfaction and internal strife, Vito Genovese's reign as a powerful mob leader faced a downward spiral. His association with narcotics conspiracies led to his eventual downfall, with Lucky Luciano allegedly orchestrating his setup, culminating in Genovese's indictment and imprisonment in 1959 for 15 years. He passed away in 1969 due to a heart attack, marking the end of a tumultuous era in organized crime. In contrast, Carlo Gambino navigated the turbulent aftermath of Anastasia's demise and the subsequent chaos within the crime family to secure a successful tenure at the helm. Under his leadership, he rebranded the crime family as the Gambino crime family, guiding it to prominence. Gambino's astute leadership and calculated maneuvers ensured the family's enduring legacy, and he lived until 1976, reaching the age of 74. The assassination of Albert Anastasia in the barbershop at the Park Sheraton in 1957 marked the conclusion of a violent chapter in organized crime. However, it also opened the doors to a new phase in Mafia history, signaling the beginning of a transformative period for the underworld. Reflecting on the intricacies of mob politics, there have been speculations regarding Lucky Luciano's possible involvement in setting up Vito Genovese, Given the betrayal of Genovese against Frank Costello, a once close ally, such a turn of events wouldn't have been surprising. There are murmurs suggesting that Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky might have had a hand in orchestrating or aiding law enforcement in maneuvering against Vito Genovese, further shaping the intricate web of mob rivalries and alliances. There exists a fascinating debate regarding the relationship between Albert Anastasia and Frank Costello within the underworld. While some narratives paint them as adversaries, a prevailing sentiment suggests that they were more likely allies. The insights from individuals close to them shed intriguing light on this dynamic. Consider George Wolfe, whose book Prime Minister of the Underworld delves into the intricate underworld connections. Wolfe, also a lawyer for both Anastasia and Costello, presents a perspective that leans towards them being friends. His intimate involvement with both figures could have offered insights into any animosity between them. However, rather than portraying enmity, his narrative hints at a harmonious relationship. Similarly, Ed Bennett Williams, another lawyer with ties to both Anastasia and Costello, echoes this sentiment. In his book, there are accounts of the two mob figures spending time together and seemingly maintaining an amicable rapport. Williams's recollections further reinforce the notion that Anastasia and Costello were more aligned as allies than adversaries. These accounts from individuals closely associated with the underworld figures carry weight in deciphering their relationship dynamics. The absence of stories highlighting intense rivalry or conflicts between Anastasia and Costello seems to suggest a camaraderie rather than hostility. Thus, based on these insights, it's plausible to consider that they operated as allies within the complex landscape of organized crime.